Well, welcome to the second talk of today's colloquium. Uh, uh, we are happy to have Haiyan Zhang uh, uh, from Busan University of Foreign Studies. Uh, she's an assistant professor there. Uh, Haiyan uh, graduated from the University of Southern California. And uh, after that, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Linguistics at Seoul National University uh, before joining her current institution. Her research interests uh, are diverse, uh, if you look at her Google Scholar page. And uh, she's, uh, but one of the major things that she investigates is the relationship between cognitive representation and physical articulation. Uh, and uh, she also has a study on uh, ego, uh, looking at iconicity in uh, speech. So you can uh, uh, look up that work as well. So it is uh, good to have you here, Haiyan. Uh, today, uh, she will talk about stimulation, uh, simulation of tongue muse. Let me start it again. <laughs> today, Haiyan will talk about uh, simulation of tongue muscle for phonological research, a case study of coronal palatalization. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Just going to share my screen first. Yes, it's shared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then let's start. So today, I'd like to talk about the tongue in phonology. Of course, as you guys all know already, I'm not the first person to consider the tongue in phonology. The way to consider the tongue in phonology can be roughly divided into two, features and gestures related to the tongue. So tongue related features include high, low, back related to the position of the tongue and distributed apical and laminal related to the participation or movement orientation of a specific part of the tongue during articulation. And the tongue related gestures include tracked variables of constriction location and constriction degree for the tongue tip and the tongue body separately. But there are including like goals, stiffness and blending strength as their values in them. Well, but today, what I focus on this talk is the interaction between the tongue tip blade and the body. Like actually it is hard to see this interactions in the features and gesture itself. The, ting, the tongue tip blade and body are physically connected by musculature. So in this figure, you can see the pink color muscle group named styloglossus runs from the tongue tip to the tongue body. Due to its structure attachment and contraction direction like this, if the tongue body is farther back in the vocal tract, the tongue tip is likely to be like more posterior together. And the blue color muscle group, genioglossus, fans out into the whole area of the tongue. And specifically the genioglossus posterior is in, the, in charge of moving the tongue forward because its contraction direction is this. So if the tongue body moves forward in the vocal tract, the tongue tip is likely to be more anterior together too. But the interaction between the tongue tip and the body is more complex. It's beyond just the physical connection between the tongue tip and body. So I will gonna show that how it's complex by using a cross-linguistic pattern of trigger vowels of coronal palatalization today. And in order to investigate the articulatory motivation for coronal palatalization, this talk focuses on instances of coronal palatalization in which coronal stops are targets and vowels are triggers. There are two main types of coronal palatalization. The first type is full coronal palatalization in which both the primary plates and mineral of articulation of the target coronal stop are changed. Dental or alveolar stops become postalveolar or palatal affricates, as shown in the example in one. Uh, the last part is a little bit 
the letter, a female speech of called Spanish tech. Traditionally, the articulatory motivation of palatalization has been explained on the basis of the tongue body position as the main articulator of trigger vowels. In this view, we might then naively expect that non-front vowels, center and back vowels, will trigger full coronal palatalization more frequently than front vowels will because non-front vowels have more posterior position of the tongue body. This then leads to another naive expectation that a low back vowel R that has the most posterior position of the tongue body will be able to trigger full coronal palatalization and maybe most frequently because of the most posterior position of the tongue body. Actually, the approach of articulatory phonology using the gestures makes the same prediction. In articulatory phonology, assimilation, including coronal palatalization, is explained as an output of blending of gesture representation. Considering that gesture blending is an averaging of goals of overlapping gestures, non-front vowels with greater target values of constriction location would be expected to be more likely trigger full coronal palatalization compared to front vowels with smaller target values. The second type is secondary coronal palatalization. The target coronal stops acquire the secondary palatal articulation while maintaining the primary place and manner of articulation. As shown in the example two, the palatal glide is superimposed on the target coronal. Here. In the articulation of front vowels, the tongue body constricts in the palatal region, and in the articulation of back vowels, the tongue body constricts in the velar region. Right? Since the secondary articulation is palatal, we might naively expect that the secondary palatalization of coronals will be triggered only by front vowels that is produced in the palatal region. Actually, the approach of featural geometry makes the same prediction. According to the extended definition in a unified feature system for consonant and vowels, front vowels produced by the front part of the tongue can have a coronal feature under their place node, and their feature of coronal is specified as minus anterior. In this approach, secondary coronal palatalization is a spreading vocalic coronal features to the consonant place node. Since back vowels do not have coronal features, only front vowels would be expected to trigger secondary coronal palatalization and maybe the full coronal palatalization under this approach. So does the actual pattern match the expectations? To answer this question, I examined cross-linguistic patterns of coronal palatalization. The typo typological data covers cases of synchronic phonological processes in which vowels trigger full or secondary palatalization of coronal stops in 38 languages belonging to 18 language families. The set of vowels trigger full and secondary coronal palatalization is the same. You can see this simple, simple schematization of the trigger vowels here. So front high vowels, back high vowels, and front mid vowels can trigger the coronal palatalization. However, I have found that the implicational relationships between vowels, the triggering vowels, within each type of coronal palatalization are different. A uh, high front vowel E is the most likely trigger of full coronal palatalization. In Japanese, E is the only triggering vowel of full coronal palatalization, changing the primary place and manner of articulation of the target coronal stop. In some languages, including Hausa, non low front vowels trigger full palatalization of coronal stops, so E and A trigger the full coronal palatalization. Although rare in a few languages like 
tone of down, high vowels trigger coronal palatalization. So in tone of down, like e, u, u, the high vowels trigger the full coronal palatalization. And there is a language, Sekani, in which both non low front vowels and the high back vowel trigger full palatalization of corona stop. Then I can summarize the implication and relationship of trigger vowel in corona, full corona palatalization like this. If mid front vowel A trigger full corona palatalization, then so will high front vowel E. And if non front high vowel U trigger full corona palatalization, then so will front high vowel E. And how about the secondary corona palatalization? As with full corona palatalization, a high front vowel E is the most common trigger of secondary corona palatalization. In Tiwa, dental stops are secondarily palatalized before E. In Navajo, E and A, the non low front vowels, trigger secondary corona palatalization. In Centani, high vocoids, E, U, including other high vocoids, trigger secondary corona palatalization, as shown in the example in nine. And in male Kochishpan Mishtek speech, coronal stops undergo secondary palatalization before non front high vowels, Lin U. This differs from instances of full palatalization because here non front high vowels can trigger secondary palatalization while high front vowels do not. So, implication and relationship of trigger vowels of secondary corona palatalization is summarized like this. The first one is the same. If mid front vowel A triggers secondary corona palatalization, then so will high front vowel E. But the second one is different from the full palatalization one. So, non front high vowels can trigger secondary corona palatalization while front vowels do not. So, U can trigger secondary corona palatalization while E does not. The implication and relationship of vowels triggering full corona palatalization is different from the naive expectations we saw before. So, U can trigger full corona palatalization only when E triggers full palatalization of coronals in the same language. And R never triggers full corona palatalization. The mismatch between the naive expectations and the actual cross linguistic patterns indicates that the full corona palatalization is not just a backward shift in place of articulation of coronals. And we need to understand the logic of the tongue movement in more detail. And the implication of relationship of vowels triggering secondary coronal palatalization is also different from the naive expectations we had. So U can trigger secondary coronal palatalization. Unlike in the case of full coronal palatalization, U can trigger secondary coronal palatalization even when E does not. This indicates that the secondary articulation imposed on coronals is not just palatal as place of articulation. Here also, A never triggers secondary coronal palatalization. So in order to understand this actual pattern observed in the cross linguistic data, we have to understand more about the logic of the tongue movement. So here, I propose that a 3D tongue simulation is a possible way to investigate the logic of tongue movement in detail. Actually, there are other methods that have been used to study tongue movement. In X-ray microbeam data, beam tracked pellets 
attach it to the tongue on surface, allow the movement trajectories of each part of the tongue to be collected. Deactivated muscles of the tongue can be indirectly inferred from the tongue shape or the trajectories of the part of the tongue, but it is difficult to examine the effect of activation and interaction of tongue muscles. I'm considering the tongue muscles because tongue muscles is the, the base of the principle of the tongue movement. Ultrasound and MRI data is really good to observe the tongue movement and shape as the result of muscular activation and interaction. And nowadays we can see the real time movement of the tongue too. But also here, it is difficult to examine the effect of activation and interaction of tongue muscles. Like we can indirectly infer which muscles are activated, but it is hard to see exactly which muscle is activated and how much is activated and what is the interaction of multiple muscles. Well, then we have the EMG method. This method can directly capture the electrical activity signal of the tongue muscle via electrodes attached to the surface of the tongue or needles inserted into muscle fiber. However, since several muscles are activated simultaneously, it is difficult to accurately specify a muscle in which an electrical signal is generated. And also it is difficult to accurately like to place the L electrode on specific muscle fibers, especially on the intrinsic muscles. We have like extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles inside the tongue. So intrinsic muscles literally in the inside of the tongue. So it is hard to place the needles exactly into that specific intrinsic muscle. So usually the EMG studies published have been focused on the extrinsic muscles activity only. Like some literatures including intrinsic muscles together too, but most of them just focus on the extrinsic muscles. So in order to investigate muscular activation and interaction, I used a biomechanical 3D tongue model of RSNs. This artisans is developed by the UBC researchers. You can see this, like pro you can download this program via this homepage. And you can see the publications and guidelines, all the things there. Since this method is a computer simulation, it is non-invasive. That's a, the strongest advantage of this simulation. And in a 3D tongue model, tongue muscles are implemented in a mesh structure based on accurate anatomical data. So in the model, we can manipulate the degree and duration of activation of both extrinsic and intrinsic tongue muscles. But there is no limitation like, to observe the intrinsic tongue muscles activation here. So here we can investigate not only the functions of individual tongue muscles, but also the effect of their interactions on the tongue shape in sequences of tongue speech sounds by manipulating combinations and timing and their activation degrees together. Specifically in the artisans, I used the static jaw hyoid tongue model in which the jaw hyoid model and the 3D finite element tongue model are coupled. You can see the actual manipulation and simulation of the model in this video. The jaw and hyoid bones provide the outline of the vocal tract. I only manipulate the tongue muscles activation and duration only. In the tongue muscle panel here, we can manipulate activation degree of each tongue muscle group. And in the time window here, we can manipulate the duration and timing of muscular activation. The result 
of specific activation and duration and timing setting can be checked by the movement and shape of the biomechanical 3D tongue model. So you can see the, the movement in real time. And if you stop and like take the screenshot, you can see all the time slots shape of the tongue separately too. By using the model, I simulate the corner vowels, e, u, a, in isolation to identify the major set of tongue muscles that should be activated in the articulation of each vowel first, before moving on to the corner palatalization environment. This right side figure shows the main characteristics of the tongue shapes observed in RTMRI frames at the temporal midpoint of e in bead, U in boot and I in odd, produced by four phoneticians. Each column of the figure corresponds to the RT MRI frames of each phonetician, a phonetician. So the RT MRI images from four speakers consistently show the bunched shape of the tongue in the articulation of E and U. The narrow constriction of the tongue body, the retraction of the tongue tip, and the advancement of the tongue root all seem to be the crucial factors to make the bunched shapes of the tongue. And the tongue shape of E and U are different in their constriction location, the palatal for E and velar region for U, the highest position of the tongue body. The consistent patterns of A are the wide constriction of the tongue body in the uvular region and the flattened configuration of the front or middle part of the tongue, and lastly, the retraction of the tongue root. So in the simulations, those aspects of the tongue shapes in the articulation of E, U, A were replicated. In the simulation of E and U, firstly, the posterior genial glosses, GGP, here the, the red lines, were activated to advance the tongue root. Like this. The activation of the GGP does not change the configuration of the tongue tip. This means that in order to achieve the bunched shapes of the tongue for E U, additional muscles must be activated. So in order to make the bunched shape of the tongue for E, the activation of inferior longitudinal IL here, the purple color lines, is crucial. And that is the an intrinsic muscle of the tongue. Since, as you can see in the left side figure, the inferior longitudinal IL runs from the tip to the root of the tongue, the contraction of the IL retracts and lowers of the tongue tip. And the retraction of the tongue tip by activating the IL actually helps to raise the tongue body. When the activation degrees of the other muscles groups are fixed, as you can see in the right figures, like in this little box. So this inferior longitudinal is really crucial to make the bunch of shape for E. In the case of U, the style glosses, this blue lines in the left side figure, was additionally activated to make the bunched shape of the tongue for U. Since the style glosses, the STY here, runs from the tip to the lateral border of the tongue, activation of this style glosses, STY, moves the whole tongue upward and backward. The, the tongue tip moves along with the tongue body. In the simulation of R, the higher glosses, HG here, the green lines in the left side figure, was activated to pull the tongue body both backward and downward. Since the higher glosses, HG, is not connected to the tongue tip, the wider contraction of the HG pulls the back 
or root of the tongue backward and downward, the tongue tip moves up. This means that additional muscles must be activated to make flat the front or middle part of the tongue. So here I show that the additional activation of the genioglossus anterior, GGA, lowers the front part of the tongue like this. There's no retraction of the tongue tip here. Well, the middle genioglossus also lowered the middle part of the tongue, but that only lowered the middle part only. So the activation of anterior genioglossus is crucial to lower the front part of the tongue in the simulation of R. Then move on to the simulation of apical coronal in isolation. Uh, in this artisan's tongue model, there is no the voice source. I just assume that everything, the consonant and vowels have the same status of the vocal cord, the voicing. So I simulated the in in a nonsense syllable ada produced by four trained phoneticians. Like you can see the four phoneticians, RTMRI frame. On the apical alveolar constriction, it may is made by activating an intrinsic tongue muscle, the superior longitudinal here, the yellow line in the, the most left side figure. So we can just activate superior longitudinal only to have the apical alveolar constriction like in the middle figure. But if you activate the MH, the minor hyoid, this like lower part of the tongue muscles, then you can elevate more the base of the tongue to help you achieve the stop closure, something like that. So a higher position of the tongue tip, like this. But the crucial muscles for this apical coronal is this superior longitudinal. Then now we can move on to the simulation of the sequence, the coronal consonant and the vowels. The tongue shape of the alveolar stop, the apical alveolar stop, the simulated in isolation was compared to that simulated with a co-articulated following vowel here. This part provides a clue to the article to motivation of coronal fertilization based on the perturbation effect of vocalic articulations on the articulation of an alveolar stop. Following the framework of article 3 phonology, muscular activations for the and the following vowel were simulated to begin at the same time. In the figure, the left side, you can see the duration of activation for each muscle is on the horizontal scale and degree of constriction is on the vertical scale and the colored boxes. The yellow one represents the activation of the and the blue one represents the activation of U in the muscular simulation. The specific muscular activation will be different, but this like boxes timing will be the same with the other vocalic context. E and, e and R. The activation duration of tongue muscles for vowels, as you can see in this figure, was set to twice the length of that of the. The simulated tongue configuration were compared at the maximum constriction point of the, the black vertical line pointed in this figure. Then let's do the, see the result. Like, Figure shows the tongue shape at the maximum constriction of an alveolar epical stop, the in four different conditions here, compared to the tongue shape of the in isolation, the black line. The three vowel conditions, e, u, a, show different degrees of tongue tip lowering. The the followed by e or articulatorily overlapping with E shows the largest degree of tongue tip lowering in the simulated shape of the tongue, like this, lowering the tongue tip. And the D followed by U also show the lowering of the tongue tip. The D followed by A maintains the upward orientation of its movement as in the isolated context. 
the different perturbation effect of the overlapping vowels on a simulated apical alveolar constriction appear to be due to the distinct anatomical functions of the tongue tip of the IL inferior longitudinal, STY style glosses, and GTA anterior genial glosses. Those muscles are responsible for the configuration of the tip and front part of the tongue in the articulation of the vowels, ibu, a, as we already seen before. So, based on the result of articulatory simulation, I suggest that lowering of the tongue tip is a crucial articulatory motivation in full coronal palatalization that changes the primary place and manner of articulation of apical coronals. The lowering of the tongue tip changes the contact point of the tongue from the tip to the blade. Since the tongue tip is lower, the vertical position of the tongue blade becomes higher than that of the tongue tip. Then as a result, the constriction location of the tongue changes to the most posterior location compared to the original target. And the change in the contact point of the tongue by lowering the tongue tip is related to the change in the manner of articulation from stops to affricates. Because affricates are similar to stops in terms of involving the full closure in their articulation, but affricates are produced by using a wider contact area of the tongue compared to the stops. The wider contact area of the tongue in the articulation of affricate is made by the tongue blade here. So the tongue tip lowering as the articulatory motivation of full coronal palatalization can explain the implicated relationship of trigger vowels of full coronal palatalization. The additional activations of IL in the context of E show the greater degree of the tongue tip lowering compared to the additional activations of STY in the context of U. This explains the asymmetry of high vowels as triggers of full coronal palatalization. U can trigger full coronal palatalization only when E does in the same language. And there is no effect of tongue tip lowering in the simulation of A. This matches the typological pattern that are never triggered for coronal palatalization. Additionally, raising of the tongue seems to be a crucial motivation factor, crucial the articulatory motivation factor, both in full and secondary coronal palatalization. Especially in secondary coronal palatalization, it is the most important factor to make the contrast between the secondarily palatalized consonant versus non-palatalized or velalized counterpart. So in that sense, the simulation results provide the articulatory motivation of implication relationship of trigger vowels of secondary coronal palatalization too. There was no difference between E and U in the degree of tongue raising in the muscle simulation. This much is that there is no implication of relationship of high vowels as triggers in secondary coronal palatalization. U can trigger coronal, secondary coronal palatalization while it does not. And there is no effect of tongue raising in the simulation of A. Ah, so that matches the typological pattern that A ah never triggers secondary coronal palatalization. So to sum up, until now, I argue that understanding the logic of tongue movement is necessary to understand phonological typological patterns. And I propose that as a possible way to investigate the logic of tongue movement, muscular simulations using a 3D tongue model can be used in phonological research. I demonstrate that the articulatory motivation of coronal palatalization can be identified through simulating the movement and configuration of the tongue using a biomechanical 3D tongue model. Then, now you're probably wondering how to use this muscle simulation result in phonology. How does the co-articulatory effect based on the muscular interaction participate in phonological computation? Hmm. Actually, my dissertation, I propose that the feature representations involving co-articulatory expectations 
based on the Moskva interaction, enter into the grammar's calculation of the phonological form. By using a feed-forward neural network, I mapped trajectories of muscular activations onto feature representations with gradient values, and I demonstrate the grammatical computations within a harmonic, harmonic grammar framework, considering both polarity and gradients of phonological features. So if you are curious about how the muscular activation is used in the phonological computation system, please read my dissertation to see this proposed phonological computation system. So thank you. That's all for today. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you. Yes, so if you have any uh, question, uh, please uh, um, send me your name and affiliation. Uh, the first question will come from Shigeto Kawahara at Keio University. Well, thanks, this was great stuff. I learned a lot. I feel like I have to relearn about all these muscles and stuff. I guess, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I teach this stuff in intro classes, but. I don't, my understanding is quite limited, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so I guess you touched upon this um, toward the end, but one of my questions was, um, do you think that these, these considerations are synchronically coded or whether, whether you know, these, these lowering of tongue dip by high valve, for example, could be a, just a diachronic origin of palatalization? And one of the reasons that I asked this is because one of the, the examples of phonological patterns are specific to like female speech and male speech, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which these are very controlled, you know? You know what I'm saying? If, if, if these have real masculine origins, then how can speakers of these languages distinguish these two patterns depending on whether you're female or male. So that, 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 okay, that's, that's one question and I'll let you <laughs> speak. Yeah, I don't know about the diachronic changes of the personalization patterns in the culture span Mishtek language, but mm -hmm. like I studied the pattern as more like socio, sociolinguistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So in their grammatical perspective, they put that the male speech is the standard form of the coronal population. And in some sense, the female speech, including the full population before front vowels, is a, a kind of innovative form. So in the young age, like younger boys, firstly, having the Chronoparatalization patterns of the female speech because their mother used that patterns. And after that, they realized that, oh, that's the female's paratalization pattern. I have to move on to the male speech. So as they grow up, they change their pattern and delete the full paratalization pattern and only use the secondary patterns before the high vowels. So I think that. Yes, the female speech speakers are more innovative in the changes of chronoparentalization. Then that is not the diachronic, but some kinds of synchronic change in the pattern of chronoparentalization in that language. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know that is a great hey. answer to your question, but yeah, I have to think about, about the diachronic changes, but in principle, I'm working on the muscular activation. So I don't think that the muscular activation itself is changed through the like time changes, but maybe um, the, like, and the combination of muscles could be different depending on the speaker's age or gender. So because there are so many variations in the articulation too. So 
here I just focus on what is the crucial, what is the core muscles in the articulation of vowels or apical alveolar. But it would be interesting to figure out which variations are possible to make the same segments or speech sounds. I see. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I have another question, but Sunghun, if anybody else has a question, happy to shut up now. Oh, <laughs> I think you, the floor is for you. Yeah, you can ask the next question. So. Right. This is quite selfish, but my two-year-old palatalizes OS, regardless of the vocalic context. Um, where does that come from? <laughs> well, I'm just curious, and you seem to have a say about it. Well, the fricatives are like more complex segments because we have to have like narrow constriction, not the full constriction like stops. Then like there we have to have more like longer duration of tongue muscle activation, right? And more like um, sensitive control of the tongue movement to tongue movement and activation too. So I actually in my dissertation I also cover how the fricatives are can be the target of chronopatulization. But like as I mentioned slightly, the degree of constriction could be different in the stops and fricatives, but the set of activated muscles are similar, right? Mm -hmm. Only the degree and the duration of the tongue muscle activation is different. So I think that would be the, the logic of the tongue movement included in the coronal palatalization is very similar. So maybe your son is trying to dramatically activate the tongue muscles in his articulation. So in that in that effort, maybe as the result of like stronger activation of the tongue muscles, the tongue body moves more high, so. moves to the more higher position, and tongue tip is retracted more. So it sounds more palatalized sounds, maybe. I assume that. It's it's almost like an overshoot. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, she, by the way, sorry. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And so she, need, she knows that you, oh, you need, the, the, the tongue has to be in that particular position for an extended time and it has to, the channel has to be really low, I mean, narrow, so it overshoots and creates a palatalization component. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, great. <laughs> Does anyone have a, a follow-up question? So I have a quick, uh, just like a uh, uh, question, like, do you, this might be not something uh, uh, directly to the uh, study, but uh, uh, do you plan to have any like follow up once the corona is over uh, with real ultrasound data, like perhaps whether this modeling works in the real life? Uh, yes, I, if I have a chance, I want to look at the coronal articulation by using the ultrasound or MRI. Mm -hmm. And also if if I had a chance, if I have a chance, I want to do some like inverse modeling of this like simulation. Mm -hmm. So from the articulatory data, I can like infer the activation of each muscular stuff. So if I have the articulatory data, then we can try to do the inverse modeling by using this simulation, I think. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, let's thank uh, uh, Hayom one more time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me, let's wrap up the event first. Uh, the uh, <coughs> event uh, was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KU University and the Linguistic Lab at ICU. 
Uh, I would like to thank the assistant Yuki Valdoria Wu, who uh, organized many aspects of the event, and also uh, the co-host Shigeto Kawahara. Uh, the next talks are, uh, in this series is the last uh, part of the series four will be on June 7. And uh, Jonah Katz from West Virginia University and Rebecca Starr from National University of Singapore will share the research. Uh, on, in a separate series on June 5th, uh, it's a Saturday, uh, Mark Brunel from University of Ottawa and Mark Karelik from University of California, San Diego will present their work. Uh, so we have uh, lots of uh, phonetics, uh, phonology work uh, in early June uh, presentation. So uh, if you have time, please join us at the time. So thank you one more time and let's stop the recording.